I'm Rana El Kalyubi. I'm co-founder and CEO of an MIT Media Lab spin-off. We're on a mission to humanize technology. Basically, what we do is we build algorithms that are trying to understand all things human. Your facial expressions, your vocal intonations, your gestures, your activities, what objects are you interacting with, all in the service of injecting a little bit of empathy and emotional intelligence into our devices and digital experiences. So you might ask why. Why on earth does AI need a little bit of emotional intelligence? Well, AI is increasingly becoming ingrained in every aspect of our lives. It's helping us become more efficient, do things faster, maybe even become happier and healthier people. What's interesting is AI is starting to take on roles that were traditionally done by humans, acting as your personal assistant, maybe helping you write an essay. <laughs> um, helping drive our cars, um, assisting with our health care, hiring our next coworker, our colleague. We're forging a new kind of partnership between humans and machines. And I would argue that this partnership requires a new social contract based on mutual trust. So there's a lot of conversation about how do we get to trust, how do humans get to trust in the AIs we're building? But I argue it's a two-way street. We humans, or we need AI to trust in us humans. We're designing these systems, we're deploying these systems, and unfortunately, we don't have an amazing track record of always doing the right thing, uh, right? Um, so we need, we need to build this mutual trust between human and machines. Unfortunately, it hasn't been going absolutely great so far. Chatbots uh, on Twitter turning racists within 24 hours. Facial recognition software discriminating against people of color, um, especially women. Self-driving cars involved in fatal accidents. We basically need to do something different. And I want to take a step back and look at, OK, well, how do humans do it? I mean, every day, we as humans Trust, we make thousands and thousands of decisions that involve trusting one another, whether it's in our personal or our professional relationships. So if you ever take a ride-sharing experience, you're trusting that your driver is going to get you there safely. Every day with our colleagues at school or at work, we're trusting that they're going to say, do what they say they're going to do. Um, even in our personal relationship, trust is really at the core of how we um, interact with one another. Trust is sometimes explicit, but actually most often it's implicit. It's, it's in the unspoken facial, vocal, and gestural cues that we use to exchange with one another. And empathy and emotional intelligence is at the very core of building that trust. So people who have high IQ tend to be more trustworthy, they're more likable, um, they're more actually persuasive, they're able to motivate people to change their behaviors, and they're overall more successful in their personal and professional lives. And I believe that that's true for AI as well. A lot of our conversation about AI is focused on the cognitive intelligence, on the IQ. But who's thinking about the EQ? We, that's the missing link. So what if technology could understand emotions just as humans can? What if we could automate that theory of mind? What if computers could tell the difference between a smile and a smirk? Uh, they both involve kind of the same region of the face, the mouth, but they have very, very different meanings. One is positive and one is actually pretty negative. What if your learning app could detect the emotional engagement of a learner and adapt the content in real time, just the way an awesome teacher would in a classroom? Or what if your doctor could objectively measure your mental health, doctor or coaching app, I guess, could objectively measure the mental health of you, right, um, instead of asking you on a scale from 1 to 10, how stressed are you? How depressed are you? How suicidal are you? How much pain are you in? That's very, right now it's very subjective, but that's the gold standard, so we can do better with data. So we believe that there are four tenets of this new social contract between humans and AI. And I want to walk you through some of these tenets. The first is that it's reciprocal. So I have two kids. And I spend a lot of my daytime and my weekends driving them from one place to another. So I would love to be able to stick them in a robo taxi <laughs> uh, that could take them all over the place. Unfortunately, I don't feel comfortable doing that because I don't believe the safety is there um, yet. We'll get there. So in the transition to a fully autonomous world, there's the world of semi-autonomous vehicles, right? So that's like a Tesla vehicle that can drive itself for a while, but at a moment's notice, it needs to hand be able to hand the control back to a driver, a human driver, or a co-pilot, as it's uh, called. Um, well, 
that vehicle needs to know if the driver is paying attention. Are they distracted? Are they texting while driving? Are they falling asleep? Are they watching a movie? That handoff challenge is really important, and we're trying to solve that by developing and partnering with car companies to install driver state monitoring systems that are able to detect in real time things like drowsiness, distraction, and potentially even intoxication. The second tenet is around data. So anybody who's familiar with machine learning, we all know that machine learning and deep learning in particular is very, very data hungry. Um, at Affectiva, we have built the world's largest emotion data repository. We have collected data from over 7.6 million faces in 87 countries around the world, which is about 5 billion facial frames that we're able to use to train and validate our algorithms. By the way, um, all of the data we've collected so far is with people's consent and opt-in. And no, I mean, we do have to have all the legalese, but we actually have a very clear consent in plain English that asks you to turn your camera on before we start recording. And it's important to us that people are able to understand how this data is being collected and being used. But the quantity of the data isn't enough because people express emotions in different ways around the world. So we took a step back at some point and we wanted to, every dot is a person in our data set. This is a while back. We probably have doubled or tripled the data since. But we wanted to look at how emotive are different cultures. And we found that Latin Americans, for example, were very, very expressive, <laughs> uh, whereas Asians were perhaps less expressive. And so if we compared people's emotions blindly, we might think that a Chinese out there or a Japanese individual out there expressed no emotion or very little emotion, which is wrong. Because when we actually place, you know, create benchmarks by culture or by ethnicity, we're able to see a lot of variation in emotion expression. We were also, actually, I was really curious <laughs> about gender differences in ex people's expressions of emotion. And we did find that women were overall more expressive than men, but it varied by culture. So for example, in the United States, we found that women smiled 40% more than men when watching advertising. In France and Germany, only 25% more. And in the UK, well, we found no significant difference between men and women in the UK. We don't know why. <laughs> it's kind of intriguing. All of this says that people express emotions in different ways. And there's a diversity. The diversity of the data is really, really critical when we're training these algorithms to avoid algorithmic bias, uh, which is what we've been seeing in facial recognition software, for instance, that is trained on a very specific population of of individuals, and it does not generalize beyond that population. So this is the data we use to train our SMILE classifier. Uh, you can see that it has uh, a balanced um, number of examples of gender uh, diversity, age diversity, and ethnic diversity. It's not perfect, but we try our best, and at least we take a very purposeful approach to sampling the data on the training side. That's also true on the testing side, so we don't just report one level of accuracy score. We actually try to look at it by subpopulation. So again, this is the accuracy result of our SMILE classifier. You can see that it's about 95% accurate for both females and males. And then we break it down by ethnic groups. What's really intriguing here is that you can see that it's particularly accurate on, on Latinas. But that provides an opportunity to look into that data. What's interesting is it's not just about the diversity of the data set. I really want to advocate for diversity and inclusion in people who are designing and deploying these AI systems. It's absolutely critical. And not just diversity of age and gender and ethnicity, but also diversity of perspectives. So we do need ethicists as part of the design experience and process. We do need people who have different lens on the problem. And I think that that's really critical. So I want to show, this is something we really think about a lot at Affectiva. I want to show you a video of our team. Um, we have a few of them here. <laughs> um, say hi afterwards. Um, but our team basically testing our software. And I just want you to look out for the different uh, diversity from a face detection and face analysis um, perspective. So for example, we have to make sure we have data of women wearing the hijab in our, in our data set. Facial beards, this is my son, he, he's required to test the software. <laughs> Glasses, hair bangs, different skin colors, 
different levels of expressivity, right? Some people are kind of poker face, some are more emotive. Sarah's particularly emotive. So I guess if our team was homogeneous, we would not be able to flag these problems early. Uh, we'd have to wait until this is deployed somewhere around the world and, and it doesn't work and hopefully somebody tells us, well, we try to get ahead of that by ensuring that our team is diverse enough and we can flag these problems early on. The final tenet is about the social contract being ethical. I want to share a story. So when we spun out of the Media Lab from MIT a number of years ago, my co-founder, Professor Rosalind Picard, and myself, and the very first two employees we had at the company, we met in her house in Newton, and we sat around her kitchen table, and we said, OK, this technology is going to become ubiquitous. There are so many use cases, which makes it super exciting, but also super challenging. And we wanted to think about what, what, what's, what's our boundary here? Um, so we came up with a number of core values for example, respecting privacy, we recognize that this data is super personal and we wanted to make sure that um, we respect that. We want it to be the trusted partner. We want it to be the partner that people trusted to share this data with. We want everything we do to be based on consent and very clear opt-in, which meant that there were some industries we just didn't feel comfortable working in. And one example is security and surveillance. Interestingly, the other industry we decided not to work in is pornography, so <laughs> no sex robots. <laughs> I can talk about that later. But we got tested on our core values a couple of years later. We were raising money for the company. This was in 2011. And we got approached by a security agency who wanted to invest $40 million in the company, but they wanted us to pivot towards security and surveillance. And it was a tough decision because we knew if, you know, if we turn the money away, we may not be raised able to raise additional money for the company and we might just run out of business, we may cease to exist. But we stuck with our core values and I actually remember one night going back home, really thinking about this hard, and I asked myself, do I want to spend my own personal mind share and my, my team's mind share and our money and our resources on a problem where we're not necessarily building trust? So we turned the money away. Thankfully, we were able to raise money from other investors and it all worked out fine. But as a team, we decide to focus our mind share on things like automotive safety, mental health, partnering with um, companies that are providing our technology for kids on the autism spectrum, or companies that are looking into facial and vocal biomarkers of depression. Uh, Parkinson's is another example. Um, so, so I believe that technology is neutral and there are possibilities to use technology to really help people and benefit society, but it's also the same technology could be used to uh, you know, manipulate and potentially abuse people and we choose to be on the help people side. What's also super exciting is that we are part of the Partnership on AI Consortium. This was a consortium that got started a number of years ago by Microsoft, Amazon, Google, IBM, and others. They invited a number of startups to join the consortium. We were one of them. We're also part, um, they, they also invited folks like ACLU and Amnesty International, which is really awesome. So a very wide variety of organizations and stakeholders. And we come together to come up with guidelines and best practices on how to implement ethics on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we're part of the Fair, Accountable, Transpa and Transparent um, AI group. There's a lot of work to be done. We're not there yet, but, but the fact that the folks who are designing these technologies are trying to get ahead uh, and, and implement ethics, um, I think is really great. So to wrap this up, I think there's a lot of conversation around how we build and deploy AI. And I want to encourage you to take a very human-centered approach on how we build and deploy AI. For us, yes, we're building amazing technology, but it's not about the technology. At the end of the day, it's actually about the people. Um, and, we, and we take that, you know, we very much focus on the human part of this equation. And I will leave you with that thought. Will AI save us or enslave us? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.